Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Christina Castaneda. Christina is the host of the Savvy Creative Podcast, a show for independent female authors, screenwriters, and bloggers to share their struggles on the craft and business of writing. She is also the creator of Be Brilliant Journal and Planner and Female Change Makers Mentorship, where she helps creative minds get stuff done with a positive mindset and fearless leadership. She is also a writer finishing her debut romance novel. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to have you. And um, I just tell the listeners, the way we actually met is Christina was in charge of a course I was in learning podcasting. And so she is the um, expert podcaster here. <laughs> I'm the student. So I just want to thank you for that. And it's actually going really well. Thanks to you. So. No, it's my pleasure. In fact, I remember watching your journey and you were just so like you were so into your interviews. You're so good at connecting with your list with your uh, guest and also your listeners. And I was so proud every time I would see those interviews grow up and you know, you'd have these great stories you were sharing. I was just so happy to see your transformation along the way. So to be part of that is an honor for me. Great. Well, thank you. So let's start out uh, because podcasting is not the only thing you do. You've done <laughs> lots of things and have lots of a adventures, it looks like. So let's start out by you telling us a little bit about like, where did you grow up? Where did you start out? A little bit about your journey and how'd you get to where you are today? Oh, it's been a crazy all over kind of journey. <laughs> I um, I was born in California, but I grew up in Texas. I grew up in Austin. Mostly I spent my teenage years there. I absolutely loved it because Austin, it was before it's very built up now, but it was weird and funky and cool. And um, Texas really taught me, you know, how to be friendly and how to be a good neighbor and appreciate the countryside. And then I had this family over here in LA, which was very like urban street oriented and, you know, it's hard life on the street, just, you know, just this different side of, of life. And so I kind of grew up in the middle of these two worlds. And I'm so grateful for that because I, I never felt like I wasn't a part of my culture or I wasn't like, you know, I, I was able to know both sides of the coin. Like I had it pretty good in Texas growing up because the way of life is easier. There's more leisure, there's more space. It's not run around and it's not as difficult to make it as it is in LA. And then I had a little bit of family growing up here in LA where I saw, oh, crime is high. Oh, you have to be street smart and careful. And I got both of that you know, street education and, and this country lifestyle. So it gave me a lot to understand people and how different people are and um, more of a deeper understanding of how to connect with people. And for that, I'm super grateful. And it always taught me to be a good friend, a good neighbor. And then I got pregnant <laughs> as a teen mom. I, and I, I had big dreams. I was a dancer growing up. I trained in ballet so hard. It was one of my first loves. And I absolutely just wanted to be a dancer and leave small town Texas and go off to New York. And, you know, Sex in the City was just starting at the time. So I was like, I'm going to go and be fabulous like Carrie Bradshaw. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know, I got pregnant. And I had a full scholarship to go to school in New York. I had everything ready. I was ready to leave. And I just thought, I, I have to keep this baby. I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And it was. I love my daughter. She's amazing. But I married my ex-husband, who is the father of my kids, and he went to the army, and we were living at Fort Hood, Texas. It was like the complete opposite of all my dreams. And, you know, from there, we were too young and too immature to be married. We just did not know what was ahead of us. And on top of that, having a baby in the mix, and then I got pregnant a second time because there's nothing to do out there. <laughs> and we, we had, uh, it was my first time being in a relationship and seeing to the point where it was getting abusive, where it was getting, you know, he was getting violent. He was starting to, I feel, I felt like he was using drugs. I couldn't say for sure, but I did, definitely saw mood changes and money was missing. And I just thought, I cannot, I can't stay. I can't do this. I'm not going to raise my kids in this situation because I had watched my family, you know, growing up, I was 
raised in a dysfunctional household with alcoholics. My mother was a hoarder, you know, like you see on TV with stuff from floor to ceiling. And I just thought I am going to be like living in the middle of nowhere for the rest of my life as an army wife with this, with my ex-husband who like, who can't even, he spends money like water and I have all these big dreams and I want to, I need, I need more for my kids. So when I had a feeling he was cheating on me and I just kind of knew you can't fight that feeling when I finally caught him and I just finally realized like he didn't come home one night and I just knew, I knew right then and there, I was like, he's, he has someone else. And it was my ticket to escape. And I left. I took two kids with me. We just packed whatever we could in suitcases. And I came to visit my family. I came to stay with my family in LA with my grandparents until they passed away uh, years later. Like I came here in, in LA in 2002 and my grandparents passed away by 2007, 2008. They were both, they were both gone. So I realized that my family was very toxic. They were just as abusive as my ex-husband. And I thought, oh my God, I've been bouncing around to these abusive relationships back and forth my whole life. And I finally had enough. I finally just said, you know, my grandparents are gone. They're the ones that I was, you know, I stayed and I wanted to be a part of the family for them because I knew we didn't have much time left. But the rest of you, I'm not going to listen to you guys fight over stuff. I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not going to let you guys go destroy yourselves. I'm going to go live my life. And that was the best thing that could have happened to us because it was hard to even like not even talk to my mother and not even talk to my parents, my parents at all. But I, at that point I was going to school at UCLA and I had um, family housing and the family housing was just a blessing because all the students that are there, they were um, grad students, med students, law students. So it's not like it was a bunch of students with keg parties. And it was for families. So there was playgrounds and swimming pools. And mm -hmm. the kids would just play outside like the childhood we had where you just shove them outside and say, okay, come back before dinner. <laughs> you know, come back at sundown. And my kids got to have that. And they just made so many friends. And all those families were away from their families as well because they're coming overseas or out of the state to study at UCLA. And they would just, we were all like, well, we're on our own. Let's help each other. And it was the first time where I was like, wow, I have the village. I have the village it takes to raise the kids. And because of that, my mindset changed. They were so successful because, you know, they were on to professional degrees and doing all this, you know, fancy research. They were very smart. And I had imposter syndrome. I was like, I can't be around these people. I must be this dumb, like bartender. I was at the time I was a bartender. I was like, I'm going to be this airhead with, with, you know, kids. And my kids happened to be older because they were all like just starting having kids or they had preschool age kids and mine were already in school. And wouldn't you know the teen mom who wouldn't be any good at raising kids guess who's everyone's coming to for like, oh my God, what's this thrash? Or, oh, oh my God, what do you do when you have to fill out this paperwork? Or what do you do when the school asks you this? And I was like, oh yeah, that's easy. Oh no. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I'm actually useful here. <laughs> and then I, I felt like, I just felt as a, it, it finally felt like I had a family after all these years of never having a family and never being loved and never being appreciated. And it was just, it made motherhood so wonderful. The kids learned to have friends. They learned how to put up boundaries. They learned how to share because it was just such a community and it was the best thing. And oh my God, that's only halfway through the story. <laughs> we leave that community because of course everybody finishes their program. You have to go. And then life got really hard. The recession hit us hard. The recession was just awful. It was so hard to find a job. And I had to take jobs that were exploitive um, because I was living on food stamps and it was really hard to you know, to get by. And I had to take jobs that were like cash under the table. So it was, it was awful. And we ended up losing our home in 2011. We ended up, you know, I got fired from, well, no, I didn't get fired. I actually left that job. And then because I was short changed because it's getting paid in cash. And then I had another job lined up afterwards, like starting the next week. So wouldn't you know it, in between that weekend, my car gets stolen <laughs> and the next job I have lined up relies on my car because I'm going to be a field sales representative. And so the guy said, okay, figure stuff out. We'll just try to hire you when you have a car, come back. So I fixed the situation and my friends actually all pitched in 
and helped me get a thousand dollar car, which was amazing. And I thought, wow, this is like great. We overcame this huge resistance with all this love. And wouldn't you know it, the guy's like, I go back and I'm like, I'm ready to start the job. And he says, I can't hire you. Sales are down. We can't bring on another person right now. And I just thought, oh no, I, I, what, what is happening? So I went four months without a job. And from there, the kids and I, we couldn't keep our apartment. We had to leave. So we would, you know, friends took us in for a little bit. We had to stay in hotels. We um, stayed in shelters. And then finally we got moved to a shelter program where they let you stay for a year and kind of get your stuff together um, until you can get on affordable housing. And oh, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare going from shelter to shelter. They treat you like animals. They like check your head for lice. They make sure you have all your shots. It's, you know, you have to be interviewed. It's not easy to just walk into one. And there's long waiting lists because this was the recession. Like everybody was in need. I mean, food banks had long lines. Everybody was grabbing what they could. I mean, when you really see when people are starving and when they're desperate and when they have nothing, people do all kinds of crazy, ruthless stuff. And you have to kind of, say, you know, God, I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to push my way through the front of the line. I'm going to, if someone pushes me down, I'm going to have to, you know, get up and push them back. It's, it, it was crazy that you have to, it has to come down to that. So we recovered from the recession. Um, and then I was working corporate jobs. And unfortunately, the corporate job, you know, I was popping in anti-anxiety pills just to sleep. I couldn't focus. I was be becoming a more detached mom, working long hours, because I was working on shoots and stuff too as well. So where you're on a set and you have to work like, you know, you're working 16, sometimes 20 hour days. And you will get a nap here and then if you get a break, sit in your car and take a 20 minute nap. But that's really it. Like you're working like a dog. And I was just so miserable. I was just making bad choices. I was drinking and like binge eating, watching Netflix, so detached from my kids. And I just thought, I can't do this anymore. And so that company had layoffs in February of 2017. And I just thought, oh my God, I saw all these good people get laid off. And I saw all these good people like cry on their way out. And they were like moms, just like me, you know, they had families or they were just, you know, they were, some of them were in their fifties and like, you know, what are they going to do now? And I just thought, oh my God, I can't let that happen. So I joined a business program. Uh, online. Um, I think you know which one. <laughs> and uh, I started a business. I had lots of products that failed. I had lots of things that failed, but I kept doing coaching calls. And it was, I kept working the business and working full time. And then um, I just was like, oh, I need to leave my job. I can't take this anymore. And sure enough, the next year, March of 2018, they had another set of layoffs. And this time I was laid off along with 100 other people. And I was so happy. I just thought, oh my God, I had been trying to pull the trigger and just quit my job for so long. And I just was like, no, I'm not ready. I can't do it. I don't have enough saved. And fate decided for me. The universe decided for me. And I was like, yeah, peace out later. Bye. I left Jerry Maguire style. I just was like, I even told, I was like, can they carry me out? And I can just wave. I was just so happy to leave. And I, I realized like, wow, I, there's no going back. I have a great severance package, unemployment benefits. I have time to make mistakes. And that's what I did. And I made a lot of mistakes, but I realized I had the time to really think about what direction I wanted to go. I had the last two years of my kids being in school and I was like, wow, I can finally go to basketball games. I can finally like do school pickup, even though they're like old enough to drive. <laughs> I can finally like, you know, make nice dinners at home instead of just coming home tired and saying, go kids, go get a pizza, <laughs> go walk to the corner and get a pizza. Um, and I just, I felt so much better. I had friendships were better. Like everything in my life ended up being better. And sure enough, I get to work with London Real, which is where um, I met you as you came through the program. And I do so many cool things and adventures. Like before I would never dream of an adventure. Oh, I can't get the time off work. I can't, you know, I can't let my boss see what I'm doing, playing hooky on Facebook. <laughs> now I'm like, I don't care. You can follow me and see whatever you want. But it's, it's been, it's, it's completely changed my life. It's changed my relationships. It's changed motherhood for me. And, um, oh my God, I guess that's where I'm at today, <laughs> but yeah, long story short, very long story. Yes. But wow, <laughs> what a journey. And so, so obviously you, you know, you got on with London real and you, 
said you were working on a lot of businesses that failed, but you, you found some that are working for you now. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I realized that I wasn't doing the one. I, so my first business was based off a lot of my corporate experience. It was um, content marketing. It was um, content strategy and copywriting because that's what people wanted from me. And then I, there was one day where I just got a big client and I'm like, yeah, big sale. And then I thought, this is just freelancing. I'm not making something that's scaling. So, and I, I realized I was, <laughs> this is probably a bad sign if you're trying to do something you really love and you feel stuck, but you, you're taking more walks. You're procrastinating on work that needs to be done. You're, um, you're just you're just not finding the joy in it and you're kind of dreading it. And that's the way I was feeling with copywriting. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I hated it. It killed my writing, killed my creativity because you're thinking sale, sale, sale. Um, it needs so many revisions and it's just not fun. It's not like the romance novels. Like I don't get to set up a love story and I don't get to do, talk about the sensual details and I don't get to put a connection between two people and build sexual tension, right? Mm -hmm. I have to just talk about a product um, or a brand story, right? And I, I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore, but how am I going to turn down the money and what am I going to, what am I going to do later? So I actually went to Latin America for three weeks. I made some good money. I had a really good month. And this is probably pretty reckless being a first year entrepreneur when you're like, wow, I got a big check. Let me just go and travel for three weeks. Um, <laughs> but you know, if that's one mistake that you can make, you should, I mean, it kind of pays off a little bit later, but I was, I, I just was like, I, my kids were going to be in a summer camp for three weeks and I've never been away from them that long. And I was like, oh my God, I've never had, I haven't had three weeks to myself since like before I had kids. So why not? And um, I did, I went to Latin America. I said, you know, I really want to practice my Spanish and I really want to just, I want to go as far away where nobody knows me and just really force myself to, you know, do crazy things and talk to people and just go on this adventure. And I knew people in Costa Rica. I knew people in Ecuador. In fact, it's funny, anywhere you go in the world, there's a London reeler. <laughs> um, and that's who helped me out in Ecuador. Um, but Argentina was where I was like really alone and people didn't speak as much English. It was really hard to actually find someone who spoke English and the Spanish was very different than the way we speak Spanish here. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to understand. And then that's of course when all my travel mishaps happened where like um, my card didn't work. Um, I couldn't get cash out and uh, like I was stuck and I couldn't like get a ride to the airport to get home. Like all these, all those crazy things that happened. But I had this time to myself and I went to a lot of places in Buenos Aires. There's, um, I got to dance, which is like my favorite thing to do. Obviously I got to tango with strangers, which I totally recommend. <laughs> and I, yeah, definitely have a, have a handsome stranger spin you on around on the floor. And then, um, I, I had, I, I went to these iconic places, um, uh, Jorge, uh, Luis Borges, a very famous writer. And then, uh, Evita, the Evita museum. Um, very iconic female leader. And there's a lot of stuff building up her museum as well. And I just kind of sat there and just really like took it in and kind of realized, am I doing what I love? I'm not doing what I love. I'm doing my job again. And it's just making me miserable. Do I, can I continue this? What do I want most of all? And I just, it hit me. I was like, you need to go back to writing and creating. Like, that's what you love. You need to go back to writing your books. And, uh, and I just thought, well, how am I going to, you know, all these things of like, you, you start panicking because you're focusing on the, the how, mm -hmm. and you think you have to know every step and how exactly you're going to get there. And then that's when I kind of released it and just said, I'm, I, I'm not going to know every step. I've just got to do what I can every day and figure it out. And so that's what I did. I came back from Latin America. Um, I had a break from London Real at the time I had like three weeks off and I just kind of like. I reconnected with my kids. They were so happy to see me again. I was like, yeah, you missed mama, didn't you, huh? You're going to clean up a little bit more. You're going to appreciate mom a little more. And then um, I, I started writing. I wrote short, short stories. I went back to my writing coach who I hadn't seen in a, like a year. And I signed up to go to the co-writing space he, he operates. And that was the great joy for me too. I met other writers. They became great friends. In fact, I hung out with one of them last night who's become like one of my closest friends. Love her like a sister. And it just, that, that started pushing me in the right direction. And then they started talking about their problems. I'm like, oh, I can solve that for you. Oh yeah, I know, I know. And then I was like, oh, 
this is what I need to do as far as a business. And then I realized um, people had negative mindsets. They couldn't get stuff done. And so I created programs around that. I realized people had problems with leadership. And so I helped them with that. And then, so I started realizing like, I don't have to, I can do the things at scale. I don't have to do this work. I just, because it was my skill, I hated it. I don't have to settle for that. And I can, even though I may not be an expert in leadership, but I'm pretty good at do uh, pr pretty good at knowing a few tactics. And even though I'm not like a Marie Kondo or who's the, who's the other person about getting like stuff done or anything, David Allen, I can still produce a pretty good journal. I can still produce a pretty good program to help people and I can still solve these problems. So that's what I did. And I started putting together the journal idea right after I got back from Latin America. It took eight months to get the prototype out mm -hmm. and, you know, do all the research, but I did it. And I love that it's helping people. And I just thought, wow, I never would have come to this if I didn't let go of what was like expected of me too. Plus everybody knew me as a copywriter. Everybody knew me as a content writer or being like the person on set and, you know, behind the scenes, doing all this stuff, behind, working behind the camera. And I was like, I have to let that go. And you guys have to get this new, you're going to have to like see more of what I can do and what I, you know, and I have to prove it to the world, right? I have to show up and document my journey and do all these things. So it, it was a, it was a rough change and, but I, I love it. Like I have got to be in the influencer space because of it. I've got to do commercials, <laughs> which have been really fun. I've got to do a lot of cool stuff because I've had to put these ideas out there and find people to help me share it. And it's, it's helped them and that brings me joy. And then I thought, okay, how else can I help women in this way? It's not just about like, I'm gonna help your copywriting make sales. It's like, no, I'm gonna help you feel good about yourself, get stuff done and um, lead your teams. So that's all been, that's all been an, a journey and it's, so, it's very humbling because you really have to kill your darlings, let go of things that just aren't working. And you have to be real with yourself. Like, am I really fulfilled? And what is gonna make me fulfilled? And be honest with yourself about that. Cause that was a really rough, rough thing for me is that I have to let it go. And it was taking another big risk. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm hearing over and over throughout your whole life, sometimes forced and sometimes on your own, taking huge risks, making big jumps, big pivots from one thing that's not even like another. <laughs> so where does all that courage come from? You know what? It's so funny. Like my dad, um, oh, he, he always had the story growing up and I remember it so clear. So we actually lived in Dallas before we moved to Austin. And when we moved to Austin, my dad worked for IBM and, uh, IBM was big in the eighties. Um, not so much in the 90s, I guess, because I mean, in the 90s, I was a teenager, so I don't really know too much. But Dell was just starting in the 90s, and they had moved to Austin. And my dad interviewed with Michael Dell himself. And before Michael Dell was like, you know, I mean, it, it was just in such the baby stages. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael Dell made my dad an offer and the package that my dad would have had. Um, like, my dad, it wasn't as great as IBM. And it wasn't as secure as IBM, so my dad turned it down. And then sure enough, Dell just grows exponentially, right? They just blew up. And my dad was like, you know, if I had taken that job with Michael Dell, we would have had $6 million in stock alone. And I would have had this and I would have had that if I had just taken that job with Michael Dell. And I was like, you know, after that, that always stuck with me because I remember him like losing that big opportunity. And he's like, you know me, I mean, er, like, you know, just someone that repeats that story all the time. And so for me, that taught me like, okay, risk, <laughs> risk, big stuff, risk, risk, risk. And you know, I've, I've done, I've done these crazy, stupid risks that have not paid off or I've just like lost big. And I've done stuff that also, that also like really paid off or I was like, wow, who saw that coming? And I, I, I just don't want to be telling my kids, you know, I could have had, I mean, cause it was not only annoying, but it just made me like, it, it just made me realize like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be that way. I, I don't want to be, cause I saw him also miserable. I saw him, my dad actually had three failed businesses mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I just don't want to 
carry what he carried and feel like I, I couldn't provide for my family. And the only thing I got to say that I do take stupid risks when it comes to business, but for me, love, it's really hard to take a risk. I'm getting better at it now, but when I was younger, I just, I would not take a chance on love. And I, I don't know if it was just from being a single mother with kids, but now I'm like, yeah, I'll go on a date or yeah, like I'm now I'm much more open to it. And um, dating now has, has been like, you know, you've got to, you've got to be ready to open your heart to someone and, you know, you can't push, keep pushing them away. Like, obviously it's not working for you. And, you know, that needs, that's probably the scariest risk for me to take in business. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's put it, put money down. Let's partner, let's work together. But you know, for my kids, I'm always like, all right, kids, push them. <laughs> you can do it into the fire you go. But um, yeah, love is probably the most difficult one for me, but I'm not afraid. Cause I think, well, I've already been in an abusive relationship. I've already lost a, a millionaire who I was madly in love with 15 years ago. And I've already like, escaped a narcissist. So I'm pretty much not scared. I think like my crazy factor <laughs> is to expand. <laughs> like I think I've hit all the targets. So anything else that comes, I'm probably not too scared of. Mm. Like, I, I know I'll be okay. I know I'll be okay with or without love. And I think that's probably the first step of being able to risk your heart is like, I'm going to be okay by myself. I'm going to be happy by myself. I'd like a partner. Um, but yeah, that, and that's, that's what made it easier for me to risk. So mm. <laughs> yes. and, and then now with your writing, I know you're going into writing romance, writing your first book. And so, boy, they almost seem opposites. I'm afraid of love, but I'm writing about romance and love. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Like I, um, so I actually have three, I, well, if you count how many novels I have complete, it's eight but um, three are ready for like, three are what I've wrote in my adult life. And they're probably the ones that I could see on bookstores. The other five were like me. I've been writing books since I was 13, right? Like I've just been writing little notebooks and, mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and it's funny what I thought about love and sex was back then compared to what it is now. You're like, wow, it's, some of it's like, wow, I'm really disappointed. And some of it's, you know, just kind of like, wow, I'm really naive. Um, so yeah, romance. What so how romance came about was that I could not put a genre for my novel, and I worked with this horrible editor, and he just like confused the heck out of me. He told me my character was a narcissist. He he the the novel was very urban women's fiction, and he was kind of like just didn't understand um, this life, and he didn't understand he didn't really understand women very much. I feel. Cause he's like, women wouldn't do this. I was like, no, women do. <laughs> like, I don't think you understand. And then I just realized he was not the right fit. It's not that he's a bad person. He just was not the right fit. And then I just thought, okay, well, you know, how do I make this work? And what book, what kind of book is it? And then when I realized what romance was now, romance doesn't mean um, like 50 shades of gray. That's not romance. That's erotica. Um, romance means love central. Is the love story is central to the plot. So that's, that's really like the difference. So you can have paranormal romance, historical romance, like Gone with the Wind, you know, um, paranormal romance would be like Twilight, you know, so you can have all these different genres of what romance is. And um, when I looked on my shelf and I was just like, you know, I don't want to be a romance writer. They're going to classify me. I'm going to have like these ugly covers. And then when I looked on my shelf, I thought, wow, 80% of these books are romance books. <laughs> And I said, you know what? I really do like romance. And once I finally said, okay, you know what? The, the love triangle, it's the love triangle in the story is very central to what happens with the characters. And it's, it's very central to the character's development and how you connect with them. And I just said, okay, I have to embrace this. And then I looked at the other two novels I have on, um, in queue. Mm -hmm. And um, even though one is a sports story because it has a lot about to do with the health and fitness sector that I work with, mm -hmm. um, there's same thing. There's a love triangle there. I'm like, oh, it's just, this is just how it's going to fit. And then the third one too, it's a love story between characters. Now, when you build love stories, um, I, I guess it's good that I don't have a partner because my married romance writer friends, they're like, yeah, you have to kind of let your husband know that this is just imagination. You're not like, it's, it's not, it's not him. It's the character, you know, things like that. And then you really have to keep your imagination wild <laughs> because you've got to build these fantasies. And I have so many fantasies and I realize this is, this is just like women um, want to ask their partner for things and they want to ask their partner 
about certain, you know, fantasies or desires that they have, but it's really hard to talk to them about it. And I'm like, wow, people really struggle with this. I'm like, baby, I want you to do this with me. Like, I'm very open about it, but it is really hard because sometimes you don't always get that. Um, you don't always get your wish come true. Most of the time I'd say I do, but not always. And I realized like, oh, I think I give women the freedom to like imagine to even tingle a little bit, like we say in the romance <laughs> as you're reading it, but to have that imagination and to kind of like be like, oh yeah, I do desire these things and it's okay. Like this character that I really connect with and admire, she's going through this and she's getting what she wants. And then I really help it, I hope it that it, it opens women's minds a little bit to be open to asking to, for what they want or knowing like their fantasies can come true. So it's really, um, that's the fun part of it. And then also when you, when you close a romance book, either it'll either be bittersweet or it's a happy ending, <laughs> giggity, right? Like, you know, no pun intended. And um, you pace the story out to where, you know, you pace out the relationship to where it's building and it's not just like these crazy hookups. It's actually like tension and a story between two characters. And it's really fun. And it's not just like you can play with a historical romance. You can p play with, um, you know, paranormal romance. You can play with just about any genre you want. And what I've noticed lately, I um, being more in the world with other romance writers, is that um, people, especially women, want heroines over 30. You know, they want women like in their 30s, 40s, and even 50s, like finding love, even with younger guys, like now it's okay to have that out there. Mm -hmm. And they love it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can share that. I've had those adventures. Like I can share adventures with younger men and I can share adventures with the older men too. But they want heroines like me. They want people of color. They want um, people who are like women who are not just like the young virgin, glowing virgin anymore. They want women that are like successful and know what they want. And I thought, wow, this is, this is kind of what empowering romance is. Yeah. And I thought, wow, you don't have to be like the damsel in distress. They, women actually want to see themselves or the women that they admire in these books. And I thought, oh, I could totally do this. I could totally bring this out. And that's been the fun breakthrough that I had last year when I was going through my, my I don't know what to do with my business. And I just decided to do these weekly things called love letters where I just take little snippets of my writing and just kind of put it out there. And one of my, my friends, she's like, yeah, I love your weekly love letters. It gives me hope because she's a single woman in her forties. And she's just like, you know, it's, it makes me swoon, but it still tells me like, oh, hope and hope for love is out there. And I'm like, you know what, that's what I really like because that's, what I'm going through. I may not have the relationship I want right now, but I still am hopeful that love will still be there and that, you know, I will get romanced. If not, guess what? I can bring that picture to life for other women. And um, yeah, I never thought it would be an empowering genre because it does not seem like it. If a guy's like holding a woman like Fabio on a cover, right? It doesn't seem like the woman is empowered. It seems like she's being safe, but it it really doesn't have to be that way. And that's what I think people don't understand. And when I discovered that, I was like, oh, this is even better than like, what? I mean, what else am I going to write? Horror or, you know, literary fiction or those are all great. And I'd actually like to explore some of those, but I feel like this was just calling me more and it was just probably, I, I feel like it's the place where I'm the most needed and where I actually have the most fun. So read romance. <laughs> yes. And as you're speaking, you know, I think in real life, I think what most women want is a man who just loves them for who they are. Exactly. Regardless of their age or their color or their profession. They just want a man who loves them fully for who they are. Yeah. And you just want to feel like you fall in love, you know, like you, you want to feel that feeling of like being nervous around each other, the tension between you, the kissing, like the, just the touching and asking for what you want and all those things. Like you want to just be, and then you, you put like the flaws of each character together, right? Like the mm -hmm. flaws of him and the flaws of her. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of these come out more, like we're seeing, you know, more undertones of what's happening today with like um, mental health, you know, characters that are flawed with um, addiction or, all, you know, any of these other things that are in the media today that are being talked about. And it's great to see that finally coming out and seeing like these imperfect heroines um, taking control of their lives and, and, and having love. 
which is so, it's so wonderful to be able to bring that uh, to women everywhere. So. Yes. yes, it is. <laughs> and it's funny, yes, I've seen some of your um, Facebook posts or Instagram posts, and you, you have these pictures and you just look like you're just free, you know, <laughs> you're one with your dress and it's just, it's just like, it looks like you're dancing on the picture. So, you know, <laughs> so one thing that's really important is to be in love with yourself. So yeah. when you're in love with yourself, I think that you could attract you, do, you, know, you do. I'm definitely into manifesting right now. It's been my latest obsession. And um, that's partly why I created the journal as well. So I can put positive self-talk in there and I can have people like get in the practice of it. And yeah, that picture where I'm dancing, <laughs> um, my daughter, I like put my dress up and I was like, get the shot. And she goes, mom, that doesn't look fake at all. I was like, shut up, get the shot. <laughs> and <laughs> she, um, she got it. And it looks, and it was the most it looks like it, it, it was like the most staged, but I had it in mind because I wanted that, like, I'm free and I'm um, like, I'm in love kind of because I'm, you know, it's a brand picture and it's very iconic. That street is not too far away from where I live and it's a very iconic street in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And of course they cropped the sign too. I'm like, oh man, the magazine cropped out the sign where like the one iconic thing that you could recognize where I am. And, um, but it came out, so perfect because I, I kind of had a feeling of what I wanted to capture in the shot. And that's kind of what you got to do when you're on Instagram or anything. You got to kind of have a shot list and capture like, okay, this is what I want to say. How am I going to capture it? And I just really wanted that like, oh, I'm in love and I'm dead. And anyone who follows me knows I dance a lot on, the, <laughs> on my videos. Yes. So I really wanted to capture that. And then um, having adventures. Uh, what was the second question? What, um, having adventures and... Yeah, um, adventures is, yeah. Yeah, I just feel so happy and so free and, you know. Well, it's been, it's been lately. There, when I'm sad, sometimes I will post on Instagram like, hey, I'm not as happy as I seem today. Um, I had a massive failure. Like, I'll share things like that that's real. Like, I think there was one time where I actually had a massive failure with, um, it was like all three things. It was my housing. It was, um, it was my business. It was just like everything kind of, and it was a, a current relationship that uh, a guy that I was seeing, like we were kind of in a rough patch at the time. And this was last month. And I was just real about that. I'm like, you know, sometimes you have to still try, even though you're, you're going to fail. And um, I didn't smile as big. And I try to like mix it up and just so I can just show what it is like to be real. But in the, in my pictures and in my adventures, I, um, Ever since my son left to college, um, being at home, even though my daughter lives with me, um, she's out most of the time, you know, she works a retail job, she's in school and I'm by myself. And I just thought I, I can't fill the space with being busy or with like needing to do little things and that's not going to be productive. Like I really have to fulfill the space with stuff that's meaningful. And I just started putting myself out there to find more people, to do more things and, and I knew that I had to grow the business and that was going to take more people and more things. <laughs> and I did. So I started making it a point to go out more. Um, to, and then I had two months without my car. And so I was stuck at home and I just thought, oh my God, I'm getting socially awkward. Like, cause I'm not around people anymore cause I was stuck. And then I just said, I have to get my social skills back. So that's why I've been out and about a lot lately. <laughs> if you've seen me doing stuff and then I'm getting invited. There's a lot of holiday stuff going on right now. There's going to be a lot of parties coming up and hopefully there'll be some more really fun pictures. But um, yeah, I, I, I try to go out there and, you know, I feel like the more I go out, the more adventure I have to write about. And the more, I, the more you like tickle your senses, I guess, you know, you have more ways to describe things. And I just need to get away from just emails and messages and things and free up time to do that. And um, it's helped me a lot. I've had a lot of writer's block lately too. So I've needed to go out and just see things, stop mm -hmm. thinking so hard about and trying to put so much pressure on myself and then just kind of be free a little bit. And it, and it helps. So I'm glad you're really liking my picture. Yeah, loving it. <laughs> loving it. So you've There's so much more coming. a few times. Tell, tell, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the journal. Like, how does that work and how does that help people? So when I was, um, so I have a gratitude practice that I was doing every day. And then I'm a very compulsive planner. 
and um, I'm a, and for writers, and I, I think for most people, like journals are just a very sacred thing because um, like how you journal and how you get out of your head can help you write your pages, right? Because you've got to focus on your character and you've got to focus on the story, but you want to just like channel a lot of what's kind of in your mind right now. And you've got to get, a, get that out in your morning pages. So I was carrying around three notebooks. And I'm like, why am I carrying around three notebooks for my gratitude practice, my planner, and my journal? And then I just thought, well, I do all this in the morning, so why don't I just put it together? And then I, or why, why doesn't someone make it where they're together? So I looked and I, I actually have stacks of different journals. I didn't like any of them. And I didn't like, like, I don't like a bunch of quotes and I don't like a bunch of, um, like, I don't want it to feel like a workbook. I want it to feel like its purpose, like empty your thoughts on here. I don't want it like, now tell me your goals. Now plan this. Like, I wanted it to be very like, it's going to make you feel good. You're going to get stuff done and you're going to actually see momentum. And there are things, and you've got to capture new ideas. Like, it's not just like, I want to just work on my goals. It's like, no, I've got to remember things. I've got to, um, I've got to get out my thoughts out of my head and I've got to focus on things that are important and still stick to a schedule. So that's kind of where I put it all together. And then I want, you can really only focus on four things at a time, like, and the, and including your relationship and your kids and, you know, whatever your health. And when you put it all together, I'm, I just said, you know, what, I'm going to fo focus on four pillars of my life and I'm going to do steps in the direction to improve them every day. And sometimes those pillars are, were like my home and my kids. And now that my kids are out of the house, it's my relationships. And so I switch them up every 90 days and, you know, I, sometimes it's wealth and investments. Okay. Well now that investments are doing well, now it's time to grow the business and, or it's time to focus more on writing. So I would, I would put those, you know, and then I would, I would put those four pillars up and then I do steps every day that really push and drive the needle forward. And that's when I started to see a lot of momentum. So one of my first customers what is my accountability partner, Felicia? She owns a skincare company called Our Skin Vibe, Vibe, and she could not get started on her business at all. She's inc she makes incredible products um, for the neck down, skin from you know from for your body, and she she had a very tragic um, loss the year before and just couldn't get it together. And she said, you know, I started with your journal, I did it every day, and I just started these little steps. And she's launching her business uh, next week over Thanksgiving. And I just thought, wow, you know, like, and we worked together on getting her business started. Um, we helped her get the plan. You know, I um, helped her with a lot of the, you know, the lead magnets and everything that we needed to get started. And yeah, she's, she's already, even though she hasn't even launched yet, she's already made, I think like $12,000, but still she's done really well. And, um, and it's all, be, and she said, you know, your journal really helped me get there and do that. And when someone tells you something like that, it's just, you, you can't, there's no substitute for something like that. Like she had a horrible tragedy and you know, I, I know what it does for me. I know that the gratitude starts off my day positively, knowing that I only have to do four things to really see growth and not feel guilty over the things that don't get done that you have to push back the next day. That's a huge thing. Our to-do lists are way too long. We feel guilty if we're not hustling, hustling, hustling. And it's not true. You have to do the work that matters. You have to do the work that gets results and you have to do the work that's not going to leave problems later. And I think that's what people don't realize. You should not feel guilty if you have to backburn one thing for something else that's important. And, and, and then if you keep backburning things, then it's probably something that you're not meant to do or that you need help with, or that you just, you just should pass on to someone else if you can. So that, those are the things that I think people need to realize instead of stop feeling guilty. And I hope that this journal helps them do that. And then at the end of 90 days, you have clarity, you have momentum, and you just, you should, you should notice that your days are more positive and that your day, in that your weeks, like there's a weekly planner and there's a monthly planner. And every week um, I do this weekly practice where it's just kind of a reflection of what went well, what didn't, and um, who can you reach out to? It's really important for you to like be constantly reaching out to people, um, not just for help, but just to connect or if you're building a business, then you have to reach out to people. And then like 
how can you be more specific? How can you stay focused? And what will you do? Like all these things that you really need to do little course corrections every week, Mm -hmm. instead of just getting to a point of like, oh my God, I'm so unhappy. What went wrong? Well, you can kind of see what, what's not working week to week if you do this reflection. And that's one thing I took from good mentors who, you know, helped me along the way. And that's, that's what I really wanted to pass on, but in the way that I do it. And it's just so important to, to, to have moments where you can be real with yourself. And that's what I wanted to give to people too, because I think we're just so, so pressured mm-hmm. around us and you need a safe place, even if it's just a little book. Mm -hmm. just empty your thoughts and just be real and say, this is not working. I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm going to fix it. And yeah, that's what I want to keep doing. And I want a whole collection of journals. In fact, I want to release like a new one every year. Mm -hmm. I like manifesting journal or a traveler's journal, a podcaster's journal. Like I'm obsessed with it now because they are fun to make. Um, they're, 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 they're like writing. They're like wonderful torture. It's like, it's, it's <laughs> the idea when it comes through is amazing and you just can't wait to get in it. And sometimes you feel creative flow and sometimes you hit a wall and you're like, oh my God, the formatting, the designer, the, the, mm-hmm. all the headaches that come with it. Um, why is it this working? Why does it look weird when I open it up? <laughs> all those things will come up. But, um, I, I just think there's just so many possibilities for journal that I journals that I just want like a full collection and Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna for releasing a book every year I'm gonna have I'm gonna make it a point to release a romance novel Mm -hmm. and a new journal every year because they're just it's fun and it's just so much love so much of my heart just goes into them that I can't I like can't even stop myself (laughs) so so, and and they're they help people too especially the podcasters journal I think okay how you know setting up for your guest and what am I doing this week? What are my numbers? Um, And then like, you know, your interview style, what's your checklist, you know, all these things like have just things that you can, that way it's all in one place and you don't have to worry about printing out different things. I, that would be really nice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Cause you know how things go wrong. Um, And I've tried to like tell you guys, oh my God, be prepared to do this. And yeah. And so this way you would just have it all. So it's, it's my, it's just so much, it's, it's just been, it's just been a weird turn in my business, but it's been the most fun thing I've ever created. And it was just such a passion project. I knew it wasn't going to be like, oh my God, I'm going to make a million dollars off a you know $20 journal. Of course not. But it just 90 days of positivity, fun and joy. And like, guess what? You, you actually accomplished something. So that makes me happy. Yeah. That is exciting. <laughs> so besides a journal, you also have a mentorship program. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so that's um, waitlisted right now. It's going to open up in 2020. And um, what I did, I opened it up in the summer and then I'm not going to be able to open it up again until 2020 because I've kind of got a lot going on right now. But um, I pretty much every month, it's I help women with media and that's kind of like the, the outside problem coming in. And if you want to build media and if you want to like put shows together and if you need help with like storyline and things like that, and if you want pretty much a lot of notes, you, you know, I will give you tons and tons of notes, <laughs> which I, I love giving brutally honest feedback, but it's really, there's a lot of mindset work that needs to be done. And it's different for everybody of what they need to work on, like what they need to let go of. Like it could be leadership. It could be just, you know, um, having to put your story out there or having to get people to understand clearly what it is that you're trying to say, um, that people would not believe how hard that really is. And so I work with women on that level and do it. And I wanted like a big mastermind group and I thought, oh, I'll scale this and do it. But then I just started taking in women one-on-one and I'm wanting to scale it bigger and reopen the doors in 2020 and work with, so it's like a media mindset. So if you want to create media, if you want to learn how to talk on camera, be on the spotlight, even partner up with brands, like I'll show you how to do all these things that I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're going to be prepared to do some mindset work as well, because you can't get to one point without this mindset, because guess what? You've got to stand in front of a camera. Guess what? A director is going to ask you to say lines and say things and walk and do all these crazy things. Like I had to twirl around in one of my commercials and I'm like, okay, this is weird. I had to flip my hair. Um, but you really have to get over that because you have an entire crew watching you and their time is valuable and you're wasting their time if you're in your head and like, I can't do it and I'm going to be stupid. I'm going to look stupid. You just kind of got to go for it. And a lot of people 
can't. And that's the thing I'm going to, I'm, I can help you with that. And like I said, I can help you build the story out of what you're trying to show on camera or what you're trying to podcast about and really refine the idea. But you're going to do a lot of mindset work. And then if you're struggling with the team as well, I have a lot of people who come to me and they're just like, I don't know what to do. This is happening on my team. I'm dealing with a narcissist or I'm dealing with um, people who just can't get along and there's drama. I can't handle it. And I'm like, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> Enemy takedown. Here's what we do. Um, and uh, it's been a weird skill that I had developing that, but I really, I don't like, I don't like seeing teams tear each other apart. I don't like seeing people, you know, when it doesn't have to be that way. And that's pretty much like a high level coaching that I offer as well. And that's like special case basis because that takes a lot of like, it, it takes a lot of time, but, um, and I have a course actually on a platform called tablet wise about how to lead teams. Um, that's a brand that I've partnered with as well, where I put courses up there and it's kind of how I test. It's like my testing ground for my courses to see if people like it. And, um, and yeah, it's a subscription. I, I companies subscribe to the platform and then they can watch all the courses that they want. So that's where a lot of my stuff lives as well. If you want to, if you have a membership there or if you want to know more, um, and it's been, it's been a good, it's been a good source for us so far, but I'm, I'm really ready to, I'm really ready for bigger things in 2020 and helping women right now and mentoring them. It's kind of showed me what our next steps are and what, what we want to do to build bigger, to help people out there. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, You've shared so much today. <laughs> so one of the questions I ask people always is, um, you've talked about so many things, but what gives you the most fulfillment, happiness in your life? What, if you had to pick a couple things, what, what things deep down just give you the most fulfillment and happiness? Motherhood, for one thing. Motherhood, um, like I said, not having not having a mother figure in my life and not having a lot of strong leaders in my life, female leaders. Um, and being a young teen mom, never, you know, people expect you to screw up and be wild and be like one of those trashy moms who, who sleeps around. And just pretty much they expected that you were just going to be the worst mother ever. Um, but motherhood brought me the greatest joy and the fact that my kids are both in college and they're doing really well and that we have a good relationship. Like not a lot of people can say that right now and that they didn't use drugs. They didn't become products of the streets. Like I can, even though we lived in some of LA's roughest neighborhoods, like looking back and being thankful for who they are every single day. And the fact that what makes me the most proud of them and what really shows me like, oh my God, I did a good job was when my son went off to college and said he makes his bed every day. Oh my God. I was like, you do. That makes me so happy. And that his roommate was actually more inspired to keep the room clean because my son was keeping the room clean. I was like, and I'm the messiest person ever. I do not know how I got such a clean son, but I'm, I was so happy. And the fact that my daughter, um, we were doing a live podcast, um, in front of an audience and this was like nerve wracking. And my daughter was starting to panic and I was just like, it's okay. You know, cause she was handling the sound. She's a sound, she's learning music production. So she knows a lot about sound technician stuff. And, you know, she was, we were able to, she was able to figure it out. And I was like, it's okay. Stay calm. We're going to figure this out. It's like, just, just, you know, you do it and I'll try to keep the, everybody from bothering you. Right. And we worked together as a team and I thought, wow, she kept cool under pressure. And when I see them include other people, like they don't like try to exclude, but even when they were kids, they always included like the younger kids. They never treated someone like, oh, you're a nuisance, go away. You can't be part of our group. They never did that. Like they always made sure everybody felt included. And I was like, wow, I'm like to see good characteristics pop up, um, not just in them, but like the people that are around them too. Like that is like, okay. We did good. And that just makes me so happy. And then fulfillment, um, of course, writing and dancing every single day. If I do not write and dance, like don't talk to me because I am not a happy person. <laughs> um, I have to do those things every day. Dancing was my greatest joy when I was younger. It always made me happy. It always kept me in the present moment. And it was the one thing that I wanted to do, but I never had the talent like the other girls. So it was really one of those hard things and hard realizations. Um, but 
And I thought it would stop me and not being able to go to New York really was a letdown. But now I'm like, no, I dance like six days a week, five, six days a week now. And I'm so happy. And I do just enough of what I want. And then I go back to writing. And then of course, my students at London Real, like you guys are like my new kids now that my kids are gone. Um, <laughs> No, when I see people change their lives and they do things that they couldn't do or that they help people who are having trouble, like that to me is so wonderful. And being able to see you guys grow and connect and really bond and, you know, that, that to me is just, you know, something that you wouldn't have had before. And that's, that's a wonderful thing that I get to do and be a part of. And that's actually taught me a lot about leadership and <laughs> working with Brian and his team and um, having this really, um, different relationship with um, Brian and his team, not just, you know, cause I've, I've grown pretty close with some of his few team, team members as well, because we've, we've known each other for more than two years now. And um, just being a part of the journey has been, and feeling included has been wonderful. And yeah, I would say those, and my, I have the most amazing friends in my life right now that I could not have had if I was still working my corporate job. And honestly, your girlfriends, you know, if you don't see your girlfriends regularly or you don't make it a point to see them at least, you know, once a month, once a week, like you got to keep them in their life because good friends are just, they're just, they're gold. Like there's nothing I love more than like a dinner with friends. Like I don't care if it's at the fanciest place or if it's in the backyard. Like I want to be around my friends and just laugh and drink wine and talk and just like last night I spent, my friend and I, we were in a restaurant, nice fancy place. We took ourselves out um, for a nice dinner, dessert, appetizers, everything, wine. We're like, we are living it up. We are tasting the good life because we both had some success with our um, ventures. And, uh, you know, it was just, we stayed until almost the restaurant closed and we got there at like six. You know? <laughs> They were like dying to kick us out. And I thought, this is the life I want. I have to, I have to have these people in my life. And that, yeah, relationships are so unbelievably fulfilling. So love your girlfriends. They're the best. <laughs> yes, thank you. And we've touched on your different products and courses throughout this, but could you kind of take a minute and just say what you're doing now that's available, how people can get a hold of you or if they want to um, get the journal. Um, just tell us, you know, what your offerings are right now. Okay. So right now we have, I have the Be Brilliant Journal and Planner and you can find it on um, my Shopify, which is linked in my, um, it's on my website and it's also SavvyCreativeChristina.com and Christina with a CH. And you can also find it on my Instagram, which is also at uh, Savvy Creative Christina, Facebook as well. And you can find all those, uh, the journal, and you can sign up for the wait list for the mentorship for 2020. Also, um, I'm proud to announce there will be a Kickstarter coming soon because our latest venture in 2020 is going to be a brick and mortar space here in Los Angeles, which is like a big, big deal because as you guys know, rent is really high, especially West Side. And um, we are starting a co-creator space. Think of WeWork, but for podcasting and for Instagrammers and for writers and all creative. So if you're in Los Angeles or if you are thinking of being a creative, you definitely want to start following us. And um, we're not just going to help people get stuff done. We are going to help build out some of these projects. So if you have a film, a feature, um, a television series, like, you know, we want to help build the next wave of media and um, everything from romance to comedy <laughs> to um, to dark and drama. So we are, that is our vision for 2020. Um, I've partnered with some amazing minds who are brilliant writers as well. And we are like, for the first time, we're pitching for funding. We're doing all these things. And as women, it is really difficult to get people who don't look like you, who don't sound like you and who um, don't uh, don't fund women. Um, it's really hard to get the project started, but we believe in so many, we believe in so many messages. There's a lot of stories that need to be told that aren't being told and they're not getting through the gate, gatekeepers of Hollywood. So it's like, all right, it's time for us to be some gatekeepers now and it's time for us to step up and lead. So that is a huge vision. We have been, it's been on my mind for months and I finally are, am starting to find the right partners and we're going to, we're going to grow this and we're going to, it's going to take a few years. It's going to take a lot of struggle, but like I said, Kickstarter should go live before 2020. 
and we are going to spend the greater part of 2020 um, finding the space and building it. And so if you have your film idea or if you've always had an idea for a television show, a book, whatever it is, better start writing it now because come by the end of the 2020, you'll probably have people who are going to want to help you build it. And that's what we want to do. And it's, it's going to be life changing. That's what we were toasting to last night. We're like, we are going to be big. So <laughs> that is super exciting. Just super it's exciting. So crazy, crazy, crazy. But things will come together if you have the vision and if you can get people to believe in you and to believe in what you, what you dream, uh, you'd be surprised who's who who will support you and who can even throw money at you. <laughs> so awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, any last words of advice on how to just create the most incredible life for yourself? You have to speak positively about your life. Like your brain is so rewired for negative thinking that you ha it's, it's your responsibility to wire it back. Nobody can do it for you. No influencer can do it. You have to do the work and just say like, I'm worth it. I'm beautiful. I'm smart. I'm brilliant. Um, and you have to act like it. You really have to believe in it. And that's why I say it's your words are so important. You can't just listen to some affirmation tracks or some guided meditations. Like it has to be your words speaking it and it has to be your belief believing it because that's the one thing nobody else can do for you. And you've got to just go, go, go for it and take that risk. Because if you don't, you, you're going to miss the opportunities and you're going to miss fulfilling relationships and people who can just level up your life. Like you beyond belief and always you know if you if you can toast with your friends you know go to that rooftop go to that watch that sunset go to, go to dinner but just take those moments and toast with your friends because there's a lot of hard times that you're going to have to get through and you want to make sure that you celebrate it every moment that you can when you know when things are when things are good <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for sharing your story. And it's very exciting what you're doing. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing the new books coming out and the new creative space. That, oh my goodness, that's just amazing. Amazing. Yes. So thank you so much for being on the podcast and all, the, all your sharing. Thank you for having me. It was so much fun to be here today. All right. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.